Clastic sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks, as you probably know, are made of sediments. Now they could be organic sedimentary rocks, which are made of the rem remains of plants, that would make something like coal. Or they could be chemical sedimentary rocks. The sediments are a result of precipitation of minerals from evaporating water. Here's an example of rock salt that was gathered at Cyril's Lake. Or this example of a chemical sedimentary rock is travertine, which is forming at Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone. Or you could have a bioclastic sedimentary rock made from the pieces of living things. Coquina is made of small pieces of seashells. Now, the term bio, of course, means life, and clastic means pieces. And it's clastic that we want to look at. Clastic sedimentary rocks are made of pieces of other rocks. We categorize the pieces by their sizes. You could have a boulder or a cobble. Now, a cobble, you might cobblestone a street. A cobble would be the size of a softball. I don't have to tell you what a pebble is or sand, and silt is just very, very, very fine sand. But clay, clay is the finest of them all. Clay is so fine that it is powdery. So here is a very simple chart showing you the four major kinds of clastic sedimentary rocks and the sizes they come from. So if you have any parts of a rock larger than sand, you can call it a conglomerate, whereas sand only would make sandstone, siltstone, and then from clay you have shale. A conglomerate. Now here you can see a rock, but inside the rock there are more rocks. Those other rocks, those are called the clasts, and they are rounded pebbles or cobbles, and you know that since they're rounded, they must have been transported and then dropped by moving water. Where? Well, here we have a beach, Santa Cruz Island, and a lot of rounded rocks. Those rocks are probably the result of the waves wearing away the sea cliffs and moving the rocks back and forth, rounding them to their present shape. Another way in which water can round would be in a fast-moving stream. So if I found this rock, I would say, hmm, I've got a boulder here. The whole rock is a boulder. But within the boulder, I've got pebbles, and most of them have some rounding to it. So I could probably conclude that this boulder was once part of a stream bed. What if instead I found this? Now these clasts inside of this rock are very angular. So that was not carried very far by running water. What could have done that? Here's an environment in which that kind of rock could have formed. Here we have a talus slope. All of this rubble fell down the side of a mountain. It was not carried by water. It's not going to be rounded. It's not going to be very well sorted. That is, it will contain a few different sizes at once. The rock that that would turn into we don't call it a conglomerate, we call it a breccia, which means broken. So I've added to our table with breccia as angular and conglomerate as rounded, each telling a different story. Sandstone, of course, made of cemented sand grains. The sand is cemented together, uh, but there is still a lot of pore space between the grains. That means that the rock is porous. It also means that if you drop water on it, water could make its way through. So it is a permeable rock as well. Sandstone makes an excellent aquifer. Water or oil can be inside the sandstone and we can pump it out with a well because it's a permeable rock. I bought this coaster. They called it Thirsty Stone. And they called it Thirsty Stone because if I put my cold drink on it and a drop fell into it, it would seep right into the stone. That is, of course, simply porous and permeable sandstone. What are the minerals in a sandstone? Almost always, it's going to be 
quartz. Why quartz? Well, after all the other minerals have weathered away, quartz is the last mineral standing. It's pretty much bomb-proof. Quartz makes up most sand, and most of the sand at the beach. There are exceptions, but quartz is the most important. Most sandstone doesn't look nice and pure like that. There are going to be impurities deposited with the sand grains. Also, the sand is going to be cemented together, and it might be cemented by something that gives it color. What's the cement? Well, it could be silica, otherwise known as quartz. It could be calcite, CaCO3, or it could be iron oxide. This picture is of Double Arch in Arches National Park. It's on the Colorado Plateau, and most of the Colorado Plateau is cemented together with iron oxide, giving it that distinctive red color. Where do you find sand deposited? Well, yeah, at the beach, of course. There are other places, however. You could find sand deposited at a sandbar of a river, like this one on the Colorado River. Or, of course, you could find it on a sand dune. The sandstone made of sand dune sand is going to be distinctive because the sand grains are so well sorted by the wind. What if you found sandstone that was 25% feldspar? Now, feldspar tends to weather much more quickly than quartz. So if you found sandstone with feldspar in it, you would know that that sand was deposited close to its original source. We would call that arcos. You could have a sandstone that was very poorly sorted and contains clay. Well, that has the wonderful name of gray wacky. Gray wacky forms in the ocean. Along the coast, there are submarine canyons, and every once in a while you get an underwater avalanche carrying the sand silt and clay barreling down and being deposited as a layer of gray wacky. Those underwater avalanches are called turbidity currents. Very often, each of those avalanches will make a distinct layer. So gray wacky can be found later as highly layered rock, sometimes with a little bit of shale in between. Here we have siltstone, very fine grained. Got to admit, not all that distinctive. I don't even ask my students to memorize it. But I thought I ought to show it. What the heck? You could have silt and clay. What do you call wet silt and clay? You know the answer. It's mud. Basically, if mud is cemented together, you have mudstone. Surprise. However, usually the layers build up so that the pressure from above will compress the clay, making the little clay sheet silicates line up. And as they line up in the same direction, they will turn that mudstone into the most common sedimentary rock of all, and that would be shale. Now, shale can be distinguished from mudstone in that it is fissile. Fissile means that it breaks very, very easily along its bedding planes. Shale tends to be in very, very thin layers. It also breaks up much more easily than sandstone. It's a softer rock because it's so fissile. Where would you find it? A river is not going to deposit clay. Clay is so fine that a river can carry it as long as it's moving. So what has to happen is that water has to find a place where it's not moving because mud is only deposited by slowly moving water. Where would that be? Maybe that river floods its banks and floods what's known as the river flood plain. This town is on a river's flood plain and when the water finally recedes they're going to find a lot of mud in their streets. When a river hits an ocean or a lake you get what's known as a delta. It will deposit sand, silt, and clay in that delta. Here we have the beautiful birdfoot delta of the Mississippi River. The sand is probably getting deposited along the edges here, while even from space you can see the clay being carried further out to sea. While the sand tends to be deposited near the coast, the silt further out, and finally the clay on the continental shelf. 
you could have a little falling down the rise. But when you get to the ocean, you don't tend to find sedimentary rocks that are clastic, too far away from the source of the rocks. A lake, of course, would be a good place to find mud and therefore a good environment of deposition for shale. Here we have the edge of Wells Lake in British Columbia, and this poor person found out the hard way that lakes have mud. Mud flats, surprise, have mud. This would be a tidal mud flat, a very quiet bay so that every time the tide goes out, the mud shows up. Any very quiet area of water. This is a lagoon at Marin Headlands. So the river brings water in, the sandbar prevents it from going out to sea, and as a result, this area is going to be very, very muddy. Future shale. One great thing about shale is that it's a wonderful place to find fossils. Like this ammonite. Unlike sandstone, shale is impermeable. Its little sheet silicate minerals prevent water from seeping through, or oil. So if oil is trapped in shale, it cannot simply be pulled out by a well. You have to mine the shale and smash it up to get the oil out of there, which is why oil shale is more expensive. So here is a more complex version of the previous chart. I could make this even more complete if I wanted to, but you know, this is good enough. So how'd you do? Do you know what that is? I see sand. I hope you see sandstone. Rounded pebbles? Oh yeah, conglomerate. Very flat layer? In fact, that is a fish scale. That must be shale. We've got very angular pieces of granite cemented together. That must be breccia. You betcha. Sorry. But it's all very well to look at a bunch of pictures. What I hope that you would be able to do, if you understood this podcast, is go outside and look at the rocks. If you were to come across this cliff, you should be able to walk up to it and look at this rock and notice that it feels sandy. And you'd say, aha, that must be sandstone. And then you notice that this rock flakes into very, very flat pieces. From that, you would obviously conclude that would be shale. In fact, you'd look at that and say, you know, I'll bet you that those rocks were deposited in a shallow sea just offshore. If you told me that, I would be very impressed.